October is almost upon us, so it should come as no surprise to any of y'all that the majority of the books I'm going to talk about in today's video are horror. I scour the internet for different book lists. My two favorite ones I recommend y'all check out will be linked down below. But out of those book lists, I pick the top books that I'm most likely to get around to reading. What is a book lover's favorite saying? So many books, so little time. I'm going to start with the books releasing October 4th. The first book I'm going to talk about is an action thriller called Cruise by Nicolas Ferraro. This one was kind of giving me S.A. Cosby, Razorblade, Tears of vibes, which if you have not read that book and you like action thrillers, tales about revenge or vengeance, I highly suggest that book to you. This is the author's first book to be translated into English and it was described as grimy, gritty, and hyper violent. I'm always on the lookout for a thriller that is described as gritty and delivers. So I think this one also being described as hyper violent we'll have that covered. So this book seems like it's centered around the sins of our father, literally. Tomas Cruz swore he would never be like his father, an abusive cocaine junkie whose gangland exploits are notorious throughout the underbelly of Northern Argentina. Well, when Samuel, Tomas's father, is sentenced to prison for 13 years, his older brother, Seba, has no choice but to abandon his life and take over Samuel's laundry list of gang gang activity, drug activity. 15 years go by, Seba is running this organization for their father or that he inherited from their father. Seba is then arrested. So what does that leave? Tomas, who has never wanted a part of this life, but the cartel boss takes Tomas's wife and daughter as collateral. Now he's left with really no choice but to choose between protecting his family and his soul as he assumes the to-do list where Seba left off, plunging into the shocking depravity of the cartel to track a drug deal gone wrong. It says this will lead him into a nightmarish bar staffed by teenage sex slaves to the murky depths of the on river and he discovers himself capable of violence he never thought possible. So the premise of that obviously darker themes, undertones of just this really heavy burden being transferred from one brother to the next, that book does seem like it's going to deliver its promise of a dark, violent, gritty, action-packed thriller. The next book I'm going to talk about is called Curse of the Reaper by Brian McGauley. This is his debut novel, but he is a seasoned WGA screenwriter whose produced credits range from family sitcoms to horror films. So I'm going to just show you footage of things that he has credits for, but he's obviously no stranger to writing, so let's hope his debut novel delivers because it is said to be an 80s and 90s slasher tribute, which I love slashers. Slashers are up there with like one of my favorite genres of horror movies. This is described as Scream meets The Shining. But when I think of Scream, I think of slashing. I think of also over the top scenarios, characters. In Curse of the Reaper, we have a man named Howard Browning and he's kind of like the Sidney Prescott of Scream, or his character is. He was in an 80s horror franchise called The Night of the Reaper. He was the main leading actor in all of those movies, Night of the Reaper and the sequels. As he's gotten older, he has now been reduced to signing autographs for his dwindling fan base. When the studio announces that they are rebooting the franchise, the aging thespian is crushed to learn he's being replaced in the iconic role by a heartthrob named Trevor Maine. So Howard is suffering from dementia and the symptoms that come along with dementia. So that is also another reason why he is no longer able to act. But Trevor, who is replacing Howard, comes with his own set of problems because he's just recently got sober. He's really trying to stay on the straight and narrow. This acting job should help him with his image and just really be like a new fresh starting point for his life. So Howard and Trevor both have things to prove, both want this role or feel like it should be theirs, but it says as Howard fights to reclaim his legacy, the sinister alter ego consumes his unraveling mind, pushing him to the brink of violence. Is the method actor succumbing to madness 
Or has the devilish reaper taken on a life of its own? Seems like a psychological horror. And you know how these always go. I feel like it's gonna be some random person in the background that is the real reaper <laughs> doing the slashing. But I feel like we're gonna be led to believe that it could be Trevor who might be a little bit too into his role. Like they said, method acting his way into real life murders. Or is it Howard who is succumbing to his dementia and is taking it to the next level and killing people. I always have a good time when I'm reading psychological horrors. Hopefully that one lives up to its 80s, 90s slasher vibe. The next one is called It Rides a Pale Horse by Andy Marino. This is the one that I feel like I would recommend most people either check out from your library, wait to see if it's gonna be on Scribd, because it seems like the writing and the presentation of this story is gonna be one of those ones where it's gonna be a lot, little bit confusing. I saw it described kind of like fever, dream-esque. With those types of writing styles, no matter how interesting the story is, I always find myself kind of split down the middle. Sometimes I'm absolutely, I love the confusion I feel, or I'm left just disliking it completely. This one is about the Larkin siblings. They're known around their small town of Woodford Falls. Both are artists. I did see there's a lot of art lingo in this book. I'm not really interested in art and I have zero knowledge of art lingo. So that's another reason why I would rather borrow this than buy just to be sure I like it. Peter Larkin, Lark to his friends, is the hometown hero, the one who went to the big city and got famous, then came back to settle down. His sister, on the other hand, Betsy, keeps to herself. When Lark goes to deliver one of his latest pieces to a fabulously rich buyer, it seems like a regular transaction. As he goes up to the gate where there is a security guard, the guard shows him a live feed, and it's Betsy, his sister, being abducted in real time. Lark is informed that she's safe for now, but her well-being is entirely in his hands. He's given a book, a book made out of skin. They tell him do what the book says and Betsy will go free. So there's not too much else I can gain from the little summary of it other than he's going to have to do some tasks that they require of him. And if he completes them, Betsy in theory should be released. But Lark realizes that as he's completing these tasks, the town that he's from, the people in it are changing. I don't know what that means. It kind of seems like this is some type of weird demonic book. The title, It Rides a Pale Horse, I'm pretty sure that's from the Book of Revelations. I feel like Lark is now ushering in something probably not good. Apparently there is a lot of graphic gore in there, which sign me up. Okay, so my next book is a mystery but it's a science fiction mystery. So I've done sci-fi horror, like horror in space. I've never done mystery in space. So this one is called Station Eternity by Mer Lafferty. And this is book one in the Mid-Solar Murders. If you like this, looks like there's gonna be more coming along. Our main character, Mallory Viridian, is constantly embroiled in murder cases that only she has the insight to solve. Outside of a classic mystery novel, being surrounded by death doesn't make you a charming amateur detective. It makes you a suspect and a social pariah. So when Mallory gets the opportunity to take refuge on a sentient space station, she thinks she has the solution. She's leaving all her worldly problems behind and heading up to space. Surely the murders will stop if her only company is alien beings. But when the station agrees to allow additional human guests, Mallory knows the break from her peculiar reality is over after the first Earth show arrives and aliens and humans alike begin to die. So it looks like for some reason Mallory was the only human allowed to go up to the space station and then when other aliens and humans started to get up there with her things started going crazy so now here Mallory is again stuck smack dab in the middle of an extraterrestrial who done it I feel like this is giving me a little bit of the Finley Donovan is killing it vibes I know some people love that series some people hate it I loved it it is this woman who is constantly in these really outlandish situations that she somehow always gets out of I don't think it's meant to be taken too seriously although there are darker elements to Finley Donovan is killing it so I feel like this is a little bit of that I wouldn't call it a cozy mystery but maybe cozier than Finley Donovan the next book is called Jack 
Jackal by Aaron E. Adams and it is a horror slash mystery thriller. It says a young black girl goes missing in the woods outside her white rust belt town but she's not the first and she may not be the last. Liz Rocher is coming home reluctantly. As a black woman Liz doesn't exactly have fond memories of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, a predominantly white town but her best friend is getting married so she braces herself for a weekend of awkward and passive aggressive reunions. On the day of the wedding, the bride's daughter, Caroline, goes missing, and the only thing left behind is the piece of white fabric covered in blood. As a frantic search begins, with the police coming to trace for Caroline, Liz is the only one who notices a pattern. A summer night, a missing girl, a party in the woods. She's seen this before. Keisha Woodson, the only other black girl in school, walked into the woods with a mysterious man and was later found with her chest cavity ripped open and her heart missing. As she starts to dig through the town's history, she uncovers a horrifying secret about the place she once called home. Children have been going missing in these woods for years, all of them black, all of them girls. We don't know exactly how long black girls have been going missing, but it makes it seem like maybe decades at least. So with the horror element, it's just interesting to know, is this a monster? Like a racist monster? I mean, come on. It's bad enough with humans now the monsters are racist. Just thinking about monster or man, which is worse. I saw Erin Adams said that she has had this story in her head for a long time. It took about two and a half years to write it. So whether the horror is just the horrors of man or there's a little bit of monster horror, that would be really interesting. Either way, very menacing, very creepy, and I'm looking forward to that. There's like a couple where I'm like, out of everything, if I get nothing else read, this will be one. It's called Malice House by Megan Shepherd. If you're new here, I love books within books. A two for, a two for one, I'm here for it. We have our main character, Haven. She's an aspiring artist. She's kind of down on her luck right now. She returns home to go through her late father's estate, clear everything out, get everything in order. While she's clearing everything out, she finds a book written by him. Mind you, her father was a Pulitzer winning author, but this is a far cry from anything he's ever written before. It's called Bedtime Stories for Monsters. It's a secret handwritten manuscript that has interweaving short stories that crawl with horrific monsters and enigmatic humans that exist somewhere between this world and the next. To Haven, this is like a godsend. I'm down on my luck. What if I illustrate my father's secret manuscript? She also decides to stay in the house while she's doing it. Well, her father warned her before he passed that the house was haunted, but she believes it was just the dementia whispering in his ear. It seems like Haven is going to begin illustrating the manuscript, and as she does, she is dealing with very eccentric people that live in the town, and she's starting to deal with creatures or things going bump in the night. It says, a monstrous creature appears under Haven's bed, right as grisly deaths are reported in the nearby woods woods. I'm not sure how invested I am in Haven's story, but bedtime stories for monsters? Are you kidding me? As a child, scary stories to tell in the dark were my jam. Could not get enough of those horrifying images. I know that book won't be illustrated, but just imagine if they had Haven's illustrations in there too. That would be so cool, but I'll be content with just this creepy stories intertwined. I knew that one was a book within a book. I knew straight from the get-go. Now this one, I did not realize what it was until I started kind of looking into uh, what it was for this video. And this one is called The Witch in the Well by Camilla Bruce. And this is an epistolary horror novel, which I just learned what that word was like two months ago. Epistolary is when the novel is written or comprised mostly of letters, documents. I've always loved that books written in various types of formats so to like have a word to put to that is awesome. This book is comprised of journals, letters, emails, and books. It says when two former friends reunite after decades apart their grudges, flawed ambitions, and shared obsession swirl into an all too real echo of a terrible town legend. We're following three points of view. We have Elizabeth, 
Elena and Kathy. Centuries ago, beautiful young Elizabeth was accused of witchcraft after several children disappeared. Her acquittal did nothing to stop her fellow townsfolk from drowning her in the well where the missing children were last seen. And then we have Elena, who is an author and social media influencer. She returns to the summer paradise of her youth to get her family's manor house ready to sell. What is going on with everyone having a family manor house? Where is my family manor house to go through and clean out? Well, actually, these are all horror, so I feel like nothing good comes out of that, so maybe I don't want one. It says the last thing she expected was connecting with and feeling inspired to write about Ilsbeth's infamous spirit. So she moves back home, just is super intrigued with Ilsbeth's story and decides, I'm gonna start researching this and writing about it. Well, her ex-childhood friend Kathy has been diligently researching and writing about Ilsbeth for years. Kathy catches wind that Elena, who is an established author and social media influencer, wants to start looking into this. And I think tensions are starting to run high and Kathy is getting very territorial of the story that she's been working so hard to put together for years. Seems like there's unreliable narrators and I put that they're probably all unlikable except for the witch. <laughs> Historical backgrounds, witchcraft, everything I need for a good time. These next ones are going to be published on October 11th and the first one is called The Dark Between the Trees by Fiona Barnett. We're following two timelines. One is in 1643 when a small group of parliamentarian soldiers are ambushed. They are ambushed in an isolated part of northern England. Their only hope for survival is to flee into these nearby woods. Unfortunately for them, those woods are known to everyone else to be a realm for witchcraft and shadows where the devil is said to go walking by moonlight. 17 men enter and only two are ever seen again. So we're gonna be getting the backstory of them going into the woods and what happens to all but two men. Then flash forward to today, we have five women who are headed into those woods, trying to just really discover once and for all what happened in those woods to those men. What's really interesting is it says that they're armed with a lot of technology, cell phones, metal detectors, GPS units, and a really detailed recent map of the area. So you have all of these things and you think, well, what could go wrong? Everything, probably. As the five women enter the woods, they quickly begin experiencing what those men all those hundreds of years ago experienced. I'm really interested to see how that plays out, who survives, and what the heck is in those woods. The next one I have is called The Hollow Kind by Andy Davidson, and this is another horror novel. This is actually described as a Southern Gothic horror because I believe it takes place in Georgia. I just see so many people praising his style of writing as a Gothic horror. You know, there's a lot of atmosphere building, and to know that people really love of his writing. I think that kind of just sets up the book for success. Our main character, Nellie Gardner, is looking for a way out of an abusive marriage when she learns that her long lost grandfather, August Redfern, has willed her his you guessed it, Turpentine Estate, big manor to clean out. You, here we go. There's definitely a theme in the books I like, I guess. I did not even realize it. So she throws everything she can into a little go bag, takes her 11 year old son and they hit the road. Turns out that the estate is a decrepit farmhouse on a thousand acres of old pine forest. But Nellie is thrilled because this is a chance for her to start over completely with her son, Max. She is so thrilled, in fact, that it says it takes her a while to realize that there's scratching on the walls at night and faint whispering as well. <laughs> also how the forest, the thousand acre forest, like Winnie the Pooh around her is eerily silent. Max, her 11 year old son, sees what his mother can't. They're no safer here than they had been in South Carolina. In fact, things might even be worse. There's something wrong with Redfern Hill. Something lurks beneath the soil ancient and hungry. I feel like with this one, it's best to go into it not knowing too much. That's all we're gonna get about that one. As someone who doesn't love a ton of atmospheric buildup, if it's done right and beautifully, I think I can handle it. And also with it being like, this really creepy haunted mansion, I can't help but just anticipate that release. The next one is by one of my favorite authors in the horror genre, Catriona Ward. Her books, The Last House on Needless Street and Sundial, gosh, they are so good. They are so weird. They're so powerful. 
they leave me with questions that can never be answered okay maybe <laughs> maybe that's going a little far but her books are definitely mind-bending and worth every page. I love her books. So this one coming out October 11th is called Little Eve. And this one has actually been out for many years. It came out in 2018, but this is its first proper US publication. Since it's been out for several years, it actually won the Shirley Jackson Award for Best Novel in 2018, and also the British Fantasy Award for Best Horror Novel in 2019. So she comes with awards. This was her second novel that she ever wrote. I'm going to do a book talk because I promised myself to stop reading them without taking notes so I can do a book talk because there's always so much I just want to talk about with no one to talk about it with. Summary is kind of short and sweet. It says, on the wind-battered isle of Altnahara off the wildest coast of Scotland, a clan prepares to bring about the end of the world and its imminent rebirth. So it says clan, but let's read that cult which I, I love reading about cults. The adder is coming and one of their number will inherit its powers. They all want the honor, but young Eve is willing to do anything for the distinction. A reckoning beyond Eve's imagination begins when Chief Inspector Black arrives to investigate a brutal murder and their sacred ceremony goes terribly wrong. So at the surface level, feels like it's just gonna be a culty book. As with any Catrion Award book, just expect the unexpected. Expect it to go deeper than you think it's gonna go. Here are my two books by Catrion Award. Can I imagine a more beautiful thing? Oh my gosh, I love her. The next book is called When the Night Bell Rings by Joe Kaplan. I was looking at her Goodreads page. She was five starring a lot of books that I love, Catrion Award being some of them. That one book I just read by T. Kingfisher. So she has very similar taste to me, which is so promising. In this book, her main characters are trapped in a mine where there's like monsters down there. In a future ravaged by fire and drought, two climate refugees ride their motorcycles across the wasteland of the western U.S. and stumble upon an old silver mine. Kind of a little dystopian-esque. It seems like the upper world is very hot, very dry. They go into the cool darkness of the caved-in tunnels in desperate search of water. The two women find a diary of a settler in search of prosperity who brought her family to Nevada in the late 1860s. Are we gonna get a little bit of the diary book within the book? Let's cross our fingers. Lavinia and the settlers discovered something monstrous that dwells in the depths of the mine, something that does not want greedy prospectors disturbing the earth. Why am I thinking of like the Lorax? <laughs> Imagine if the Lorax was a horror movie. Maybe we're supposed to root for the monster in the mine because he's like, you have done enough. So they're trapped and injured in the mine somehow and they discover they're not alone with no easy way out. Sounds just like The Descent. One of my favorite movies. I'm here for it. Four more books, y'all. Let's get through them. So next book is called The Lavender House. It is supposed to be Knives Out with a queer historical twist. I'm sorry. Yes. This book is set in the 1950s where being homosexual is illegal. It's dangerous to be open and proud. We're following Evander Mills, or Andy for short. He was recently fired from the San Francisco police after being caught in a raid on a gay bar. So now without a job, he's actually hired by someone from a family called the La Montaigne family. They are the head of a soap empire, so they're really wealthy. The head of the family, Irene La Montaigne, was recently found deceased. But Irene's widow does not think that it was accidental. The Lavender House has been made into this safe space where people of any sexuality can come and live and be open and proud. Because of that, there is very limited entry into the Lavender House. Irene's widow believes that it was someone close to the family because how else would they enter the premise? So now it's up to Andy to kind of infiltrate the compound, ask questions, look around, who's suspicious, what's going on, who killed Irene and why. Running a soap empire can be a dirty business. If you're a fan of Knives Out, you're a fan of mysteries, I won't say it's like a locked room mystery, but it does seem like it's all taking place within this one area. And of course, everyone's gay, so, I love that and that's called the Lavender House and it's like a soap empire. 
I love lavender soap. Next book by John Mars called Keep in the Family and this is a mystery thriller and this book is coming out October 18th. I've read one book by John Mars and it was called What Lies Between Us. He does seem to write darker books. Zero happy moments in these books. Like What Lies Between Us from start to finish was kind of a downer. I closed it and I said Okay, I think that's enough of John Mars for now. So Mia and Finn are busy turning a derelict house into their dream home when Mia unexpectedly falls pregnant, which is very unexpected because Mia has not successfully been able to get pregnant and carry the baby to term. Just as they're getting the house together, getting everything ready, they find a chilling message scored into a skirting board, which I feel like that's like the baseboard, maybe like the baseboard of a wall. And it says, I will save them from the attic. Following the clue up into the eaves, the couple make a gruesome discovery. Their dream home was once a house of horrors. So in the wake of the traumatic discovery, the baby comes and Mia can't shake her fixation with the monstrous crimes that happened right above them. After the shocking discovery, I can't even imagine living in the house. Mia is obsessed with whatever they found in the attic. And mind you, she's also a new mom dealing with a newborn baby. They're still living in this house of horrors. Secrecy shrouds the mystery of the attic, but when shards of a dark truth start to emerge, Mia realizes the danger is terrifyingly present. If you're into dark thrillers, heavy undertones, that one's for you. This book probably is the one I've seen the most buzz out of all the books. And also if you are part of Book of the Month, they put a little devil pitchfork as a clue and I'm pretty sure <laughs> based on the cover that this is gonna be a pick for next month. It's called Sign Here by Claudia Lux. This involves two storylines and they eventually weave together the interesting premise of a man who works in hell and his name is Peyote. Peyote Trip. Peyote is some type of hallucinogenic something or other. I'm not quite sure. But for his name to be Peyote Trip is hilarious. And I think we're starting off strong there. So it says Peyote Trip has a pretty good gig in the deals department on the fifth floor of hell. Pay has a plan. All he needs is one last member of the Harrison family to sell their soul. So here we have Peyote in hell. And then we have this Harrison family who apparently if Peyote gets one of them to sign their soul away, he gets a major promotion. So he's really working towards that goal. Now with the Harrisons, they're on a retreat, their family lake house for the summer. The opportunity Pei has waited a millennium for might finally be in his grasp. With the help of his charismatic coworker, Calamity, he sets a plan in motion. But things aren't always as they seem on earth or in hell. That's basically it. This one comes out October 25th. I think people were getting like Grady Hendrix vibes. I love, love Grady Hendrix. That one looks promising because I feel like, especially because it's so mainstream, the writing is going to be right up my alley. The story, Peyote and Calamity, I'm here for it. I'm pretty sure I'm going to add that to my book of the month, October box. Now the last one I'm going to talk about is really short, it's pretty much like a novella, it's really short. It's coming out October 31st, so Halloween, it's only 132 pages, and it's called Beach Bodies. This is said to be a home invasion but it's more of a what is invading, not a who. It's set in a doomsday bunker of a billionaire, but the billionaire is not there. It is the person that cleans it. So her name is Julie and she's the caretaker of the bunker. Her alongside her on again, off again boyfriend, it says they're about to discover those concrete walls of the bunker are good, too good, at keeping them trapped with the horrors inside. 20 feet below the world's most beautiful beach, they'll face the ultimate evil, one that transcends death itself. Definitely intrigues me, and with short reads like that, I pick them up, and if I love it, great. If I hate it, not much time was wasted. That is my last one. Whew. There are all of the new horror and thriller books I'm looking forward to in October. I do have my October TBR already set, so if you didn't see that video, I will link it right up here. Do any of these sound good to you? Which ones are you going to pick up to read? If you do end up reading any of them, come back here. Tell me, did you love it? Did you hate it? Let me know. Thank you for sticking around to the end. You take care, and I will see you in my next video.